Well, hey, and welcome back to the middle of another project. You join me as I've made up two custom lead screws. They're left-handed trapezoidal, and I'm sure someone sells them, but they're not a common size, so I made them myself. And what I need to do now is make a flanged nut to go along with them. It's a bit more involved to make them than making a regular nut because you need a custom cutter to be made for this size and shape of tooth. But I've done them before and it really shouldn't be too difficult once the cutter is made. The only hurdle is material. I used up the last of my bearing bronze making the new cross slide and in any event I need a pretty big piece of bronze for these two pieces. Now obviously if push comes to shove, I can use steel and just use a lot of grease to prevent the soft steel from galling up against each other, so it's not out of the question, but if I can use a proper bearing material, I would much prefer that. And thankfully I always have a cheap and simple solution in the form of cast iron. And apart from the mess that cast iron always makes, I do enjoy machining it. It machines nicely, it's cheap and it is a great bearing material. And it's also great at absorbing vibration. The thing is though, I don't usually keep a whole lot of cast iron on hand. It's not as readily available as steel, and in any event, steel is a more versatile material to have on hand. With that said though, I do have a fair amount of cast iron in the form of old dumbbells. This one here is the one I cut down to make the weight for the fly press. And what I have here is that handle section, which has done pretty much nothing but collect dust for the past year and a bit. And the good thing is, I've just measured it, and if I cut it down and clean it up, there should be enough there to make two flange nuts, which is what I need to finish this project. At least on paper, this should work. Although, will it? You know, I get asked every now and then if cast iron weights are a good source of cast iron for machining, and in general, my answer is usually, it might work well if you use it in light applications where it won't be under a whole lot of stress. As a weight, or maybe a very basic bearing material, it should work. But after this video, I'm going to change my opinion to be, yes it's good to use as a weight, maybe not so good to use as a bearing material. And using it for anything else is probably out of the question. And the reason for it is, I've used four different castings over the years, and every single time, there's always been something that's been wrong with it. And it's now gotten to the point where I think it's best to use properly sourced cast iron. Like this. What I have here is the good stuff, and the reason why I think it's very good is for a few reasons. The big one being is I at least know what it is. What it is is 4E continuous cast iron, and I know what the rough physical properties of it are, and it is controlled, tested, and verified. So it's roughly 3.5% carbon, 2.5% silicon, and roughly, at least on the low end, 155 megapascals of tensile strength. And look, it's true, I don't always need to use this information when I'm making stuff, but it is always nice to know, and it's nice to have it verifiable. With these weights, on the other hand, you really have no idea what it is. For sure, this stuff is grey cast iron, you can tell when you drill into it, but outside of that, you really have no idea. I'm sure this stuff is bottom of the barrel, it's designed to be cheap, and what they've probably done is they've gotten a few sources of cast iron, thrown it all together, and then cast it. And of course, that is fine for weights, but it's not really what you want when it comes to machining and possibly putting it under load. I mean, what's the tensile strength? You don't know. What's the carbon percentage? You don't know. What's the Young's modulus? Because that can vary a lot. You really don't know. But again, being realistic, it's really not what I'm looking for because most of the time, I'm not pushing parts and materials to their absolute limit. But with that said, it is nice to know exactly what you're getting. And just to add to that, sometimes you actually don't get cast iron at all, because I have been unlucky on a few occasions that some of the weights that I have tried to cut into have actually been cast steel, not cast iron. Very different material, very different properties, and if you get cast steel, you're not going to be able to use it in the same way as cast iron. What I really think matters though, is the quality of the underlying casting. And whilst it's not impossible to have good cast iron have issues, it's going to be a lot better on average than what you can get from a dumbbell. And the biggest issue with the dumbbells is that they're generally made using a sand cast. And it's pretty self-explanatory. You make a mould in the sand, and then you pour hot metal into the mould to form the shape of the part that you want to make. It's good for cost, it's good for speed, but it's generally bad for porosity. Obviously there are a whole lot of steps to designing these moulds to help prevent porosity, but for something like this, those steps weren't taken. And this one here is a really good example of that. It's really difficult to see, but just shining a light into it, I could see three different porosity voids in the side wall of this hole. 
Two of them are pretty small, but one of them I was able to put a right angled pick in it, and it is pretty deep. And the crazy thing is, that is just three from this one hole. It really is a total unknown what the rest of it is going to be like, and I really wouldn't expect it to be a whole lot better. And of course the biggest issue with that is these voids lower the strength and can cause the part to break at much lower strengths than you would expect it to. And obviously you really don't know just how bad the overall casting is. And that's why the proper machining stuff is made using a continuous casting method. With this method there's no air to displace so this casting method should produce much better casts. And in machining it I have found that to be the case. It's not going to be risk free but generally it is going to be a lot better. Although porosity is not just these big voids, which you might think of, the cast iron itself can be incredibly porous on a smaller scale. And this really showed itself once I started to turn it down and clean it up. When I was machining this, I was using a brand new insert, which should leave a great surface finish, but as you can probably see, the new surface looks all torn up and bubbly. And that's because the cast iron itself is porous. There's a few reasons why this can occur, but I'm going to put this down to bad casting prep. If you don't melt it correctly or if it's too humid, gases get dissolved into the hot molten iron and they tend to release as the part cools, leaving this porous finish. And it's not just cast iron, I mean if you've ever done aluminium, you know all too well just how easy it is to get dissolved gases and a porous finish. However, it is a pretty bad sign to see it here. And the reason why it's a bad sign is that the porosity makes it brittle and very easily break apart, even when you're just doing light machine passes. Now to really highlight the difference, what I have here are two flange nuts which I made. The one on the left was made from a small offcast of good or at least acceptable cast iron. And the one on the right is the cast iron which I made from the weight. And immediately I'm sure you can tell the difference. I mean the one on the left is not perfect, but it is leagues better than the one on the right. This is the finish that I got right off the lathe and off the bat it's shinier, it doesn't look as porous and it's produced a much better part. The other one though, it is a real mess. I mean, I didn't ruin this on purpose, I did almost the exact same speeds and feeds with light cuts and sharp cutters, and even just trying my best, it just started to fall apart as I was machining it. As you can see, the good one has intact threads which are more than good enough. The other one though is a disaster, and this has nothing to do with chatter, because there really wasn't any chatter at all, even though it was a pretty long cutter. The reason for this is the porosity and the brittle nature of the cast iron. And because it was so brittle, the second I started to cut it under any load, it would just start to blow out. I mean, it's probably usable, but I just wouldn't trust it to hold up for very long. And it's a very similar story on the outside. This is a 1.25 pitch thread, which is okay on the good piece. I mean, it could be a little bit better. But on the other piece, I mean, there are sections where the thread is just straight up missing. The metal was just so brittle that it just blew off when I tried to machine it. So even just trying to use this as a bearing material has gone wrong in a few different ways. And of course these are some very specific examples, but it should paint the overall picture that if you are going to need cast iron and you do need to machine it and you do want to put it under any sort of load, get cast iron that is made for machining. Of course your mileage may vary, I'm sure there are some of you that have gotten good pieces that can be used, but it is a real gamble and in the few times that I have used it, it hasn't always worked out all that well. Compare that to the good cast iron, and every single time that I do use it, it always seems to work. At the end of the day, use your judgement, but at least for me, I'm going to stick to the good cast iron. And that's about it for now. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next week.